Every spring and summer, thousands of Americans take to the roads and trails that honeycomb the United States. Under their own power, they travel across the face of the land, spending one day, a weekend, or a whole season enjoying inexpensive outdoor vacations. A great many of these vacationists are youth hostelers. They are encouraged to travel and make use of the low-cost facilities arranged for by the American Youth Hostels Organization. The hostel organization in America is a nonprofit movement that functions without government assistance for the pleasure and benefit of those interested in hosteling. Since its adoption from Germany, hosteling has achieved a growing popularity in the United States. Added to the benefits of healthy recreation and opportunity for travel, more and more Americans are discovering that hosteling offers a very practical education. The classroom is all out of doors, and the principal teacher is nature. Education in the works of man may be found too, evidences of his institutions and his history. For example, Open to all who wish to see is the Cornwall Iron Pit, oldest iron mine in America. From here came the iron, which, forged into Revolutionary War cannon, helped to win America's independence. For Americans, it is a lesson in courage and humility to visit Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, a popular point of interest along the hostile trail. Here, America preserves the memory of those citizen soldiers who suffered hunger, nakedness, and sickness through the terrible winter of 1777-1778. 11,000 ragged men who endured to preserve the integrity of the Continental Army. The restored headquarters of the Commander-in-Chief, General George Washington, is today a shrine to faith and endurance. But it was to his men that Washington gave the credit for final victory. Huddled together in tiny huts with crude mud and log fireplaces, hungry and dispirited, somehow they kept alive the determination to be free. Twelve in a cabin they managed to exist. And though nearly 3,000 men were unfit for duty, Valley Forge became the turning point in America's fight for independence. At Valley Forge, a favorite hostel route, the Horseshoe Trail begins. The trail is 116 miles long and is open to cyclists, hikers, and horseback riders alike. A traveler on the Horseshoe Trail, one weekend in July, might have seen this group pausing to check their map. The group consisted of Ernie, a clerk in a men's clothing store. Gloria, secretary in a metropolitan banking firm. And Ruth, a student from Japan. Ruth, or Fumi as she is called in Japanese, is in the United States for nurses training.
Getting lost is a common enough occurrence, but on the open road, help is offered freely and new groups form without formality. The common bond being the youth hostel pass. Once Ernie is certain that they can all easily reach the nearby Cannon Hill Hostel, the two groups push off, bound for the nearest link in the chain of hostel shelters. In America, small, informal hostels serving about 20 to 100 is the usual rule. There are about 125 hostels in the United States at present. This particular one, near the village of Brickerville, Pennsylvania, is on the farm of Mr. Paul Hegel, an immigrant from Germany. Since the keynote in hosteling is friendship, Mr. Hagel's greeting also brings with it the welcome of the local committee which sponsors the hostel. Upon registering, the hosteler surrenders his membership card to the house parent for the night. This is returned the next morning after payment of a nominal fee for the lodging. AYH cards are also honored in 23 other countries as well. Mrs. Hagel, the house mother, is on hand to escort the girls to the women's dormitory. The hostel furnishes roof, bed, and blankets, but the hostelers carry their own sheet sacks, toilet articles, and eating utensils. The girls usually bring a skirt and blouse for social wear. The main thing is to carry a light knapsack in Pennsylvania, just as in Europe. This is a familiar routine to Otto, an exchange student who formed the habit years ago in Germany. Since hostelers buy and cook their own food, a request for shopping volunteers gets results. Newly arrived Gloria is recruited for the purchasing committee to buy provisions for the group. Charles, recruited earlier, finishes taking grocery orders from other hostelers and gets directions to the nearest store from House Father Hegel. The three shoppers start off on the first step toward dinner. Since hosteling in America is independent of state support, Hostelers share in the work of cleaning, maintaining, and even building the hostel itself, if need be. Here, under the direction of a local carpenter, the hostelers work on a new shed to house showers. Everybody pitches in. Meanwhile, the Hagels do not neglect their own chores. With the tobacco ready for harvest, the hostile house parents are hard at work bringing in the crop. Going by Mr. Hagel's directions, the food committee arrives at the grocery store. The sign on the door says delicatessen. But here, as in country stores everywhere, you can buy almost anything. 
food to be eaten in a single meal is the usual order. Mr. Fetter, the storekeeper, is used to hostile trade. Buying for the crowd cuts down the cost, making hosteling the most inexpensive method of travel in the United States today. Purchases completed, the trio heads back without delay. Meantime, back at the hostel, preparations for the evening meal are already underway. Later, the Hegel front porch makes a fine outdoor dining room and turns the hostel guest list into a large, happy family group. popular after-dinner entertainment in this region is the barn dance. The musical equipment is furnished by local residents. Somehow, the evening always seems too short. For the next day's journey demands plenty of sleep and rest. Lights out by 10 is the hostile rule. The deadline for departure at hostels is 9 o'clock. Time enough for cleaning up and for breakfast. Breakfast at a hostel is an easy meal. You buy an egg or two for a few pennies from Mrs. Hagel. You listen to the cheerful sizzle of frying bacon. Then you sit down to a friendly meal that seems to taste better away from the noise and hurry of city life. Serving, cooking, and dishwashing for the group is done by committee, and the work rotates so that each hosteler does his share. Ernie, Gloria, and Ruth are getting an early start in order to reach historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania before dark. But several other hostelers point out the threatening bad weather. Storm or not, they decide to push on. Behind them, the cleanup committee pitches into the pots and pans. Meanwhile, Ernie and the girls change their minds. Gloria says it's silly to get wet, so they turn back.
the rest of the hostelers have already gathered together to wait out the storm. No one sticks to a rigid schedule when hosteling, so when a hosteler interrupts his journey to run for cover, he runs. When there is rain on the roof, there's friendship and good fellowship. This is when new friendships are formed. This is when trips and experiences, past and present, are talked over. Mr. Hagel, the house father, also reigned in, can devote full time to playing host. Wherever there is a rainstorm, there you will always find a card game, and usually a fire in the fireplace. Add a burning log to raindrops, and you create good company. In such a pleasant atmosphere, it seems almost a pity to announce that the skies are clearing. But that is what is happening. And it's the cue for moving on. Once again, it's goodbye to the house parents of Cannon Hill Hostel as the hostelers start off on new journeys. Some are headed for home, and some for the next youth hostel, heading into new associations, new friendships, and new understandings. Perhaps the most important benefit of hosteling is the opportunity it offers for understanding for being thrown together with people of different ideas, different ways of living, even different languages, soon proves that there is really no difference among us at all. To hostelers, the common bond is the open road. <laughs>